signs in front of us. So if you can't see what's happening in IT to be looking or pointing, um, that's the method we're going to try and use. So we have with us tonight, from uh, my right, we have uh, Tim Lewis from COPE, Ellen Woodsworth from COPE, Adrian Carr from the Green Party, uh, Raymond Louis is not with us yet, you see him. Um, Brandon Helton from uh, Neighbourhoods for Sustainable Vancouver, running for mayor, Elizabeth Murphy running for a council position from Neighbourhoods for Sustainable Vancouver, Councillor Anton is not with us yet, and Ken Charco, who is representing the NPA in the candidacy for council. So I would like to, uh, I'd like to start by inviting each of the candidates that's with us to introduce themselves into the one minute, one minute presentation. So maybe, uh, Tim, can you start? Can you the mic? Thank you all. Uh, turnout we've been on campaign trail now for six weeks and I gotta tell you the Dunbar Residence Association has the best turnout by far. I'm running for city council because I want to get things done. Get things done by working with people from all points on the political spectrum. I have a 30 year history of doing that. 30 years ago I founded the Antidark system working with people from many different points on the political spectrum on the park board for six years, working with my friends in another party, the NPA, to cut perks to park commissioners and to bring in North America's most restrictive policy on whales in captivity. On council for six years, working with Raymond Louis to bring in Canada's first ever ethical purchasing policy. I'm working with Peter Ladner in the NPA to establish Vancouver's Food Policy Council. But enough about what I have done. I want to tell you very quickly what I want to do. I want to put neighborhoods in charge of their own neighborhood. And if Dunbar says they don't want laneway housing, then there's no laneway housing in Dunbar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councilor Woodward. Thank you very much. I've been working very hard for three years to strengthen neighborhoods. I think we have to look at the neighborhood system and make sure there are area plans in place that have teeth, and that's what we go by. I think we have area plans in place before we swap rezoning so that we know what the community wants and we can assure 20% affordable housing, the community parks, the childcare, and other things that we need. We also need democratic reform. We need war so that people have somebody who's accountable to them, so there'd be some from the, the ward and a few at large who would represent us at Metro. I worked very hard to take the lead at fighting the casino at Northeast Falls Creek. I stood up against mixed martial arts. I've been fighting for civil liberties. And as a person who organized in the downtown east side, I've worked very hard to look at the needs of renters, people in the SROs, and to really campaign to make Vancouver a city for everyone. Van COPE is a 40-year-old party that has stood very clear in our positions. We've stood steady. And at council, I've worked with the Dunbar Residents Association on a couple of projects that were coming in and the development that they were saying was seniors, but was just a way for developers to build a very big development, a very expensive development, and a development that wasn't meeting the needs of the Dunbar area residents, and I stood up and voted against it. I look forward to working with the Dunbar residents as I work with the residents in Grandview Woodlands, the downtown east side, Marple, Northway, and across the city to make this city have the kind of affordability it needs for the youth, the seniors, the immigrants, the young people, and to make sure there's transportation system. We've got to make sure that Translates comes back so it's in the hands of people who are elected. And we have to make sure that we work together to make sure that this is a city that everyone can continue to live in, not be driven out by market demands. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone, and what a great turnout. My name is Adrian Carr. Um, I am uh, uh, known to you, I think, largely from the fact that I was uh, involved in the Green Party. 
helped to found North America's first Green Party. Um, but what you may not know about me is I was born in Vancouver. Um, I have a master's degree in urban geography from UBC. I studied with Walter Hardwick and David Lay, and I did my master's thesis on the role of community groups in creating community spirit and stopping development that they didn't like in Kitsilano. I think those are the same issues that are facing us today in Vancouver. We're at a crossroads. I'm running for council because I love this city. And I believe that the challenge, the question we have faced now is how do we grow or how do we accommodate some growth without compromising the neighborhoods and quality of life that we love. I believe I can help in that. I've got the skills to do so. On November 19th, I'll be your only green on the ballot. The firefighters have recommended me. I'm very honored. I hope you recommend me. Put me first on the ballot. you still got nine choices. Thank you. Casalou, you have one minute of introduction. Good evening, everyone. I am uh, Raymond Louis, and I'm running for re-election with Vision Vancouver, Mayor Gregor Robertson in Vision Vancouver, and I'm pleased to see the number of people in the room tonight. Uh, I've met and uh, worked with some of you in the room over the course of my nine years on council, and I uh, hope to have the opportunity to do that again. But I want to tell you a little bit about myself, for those that don't know. I was born and raised in the city of Vancouver. I, uh, my family owned a small business on Commercial Drive for 25 years. I have three children, still in the school system, and I live on the east side of Vancouver. But I come to your neighborhood often over my time as nine years. And I uh, have worked on a number of, of issues uh, with Jane coming to council uh, many times and corresponding with her lots. Uh, she's, uh, a uh, fierce advocate for the, for the neighborhood, but not just Jane, but uh, many of uh, you within the room as well. I hope that uh, our message in terms of providing affordable housing, working on transportation issues, making sure our city is safe and keeping our taxes low has, has uh, resonated with all of you. I look forward to, after this, a uh, little bit of uh, uh, conversation that we have uh, at the front, to have some conversation with you afterwards as well. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Randy Helton. I'm running for the position of Mayor of the City of Vancouver with Neighborhoods for a Sustainable Vancouver. Our website is nsvancouver.ca. Now we have four others running with us, that we're making a total of five. And we've also recommended six others, even from other parties that we could work very well with. There's a silent crisis going on in Vancouver right now, and I can tell you from personal experience. I've been at City Hall many times. I'm from the West End where we have found very problematic uh, development and rezoning applications coming through. Uh, citizens of Vancouver over the last several years have spent tens of thousands of hours fighting City Hall. This is very rarely covered adequately in the mainstream media. I would say that there's what looks like a, a crisis of, um, it looks like systemic corruption, and it's based on the problem of campaign financing. I know this because I've, I've seen and, and felt what it's like to be in a community. Uh, there are communities in the east and west of the city who have a lot of problems with what's going on at City Hall. Neighborhoods for Sustainable Vancouver has some great ideas, lots of policies. We think we have the experience and the grassroots support that we can fix the city. Please vote for us and the people we recommend, and we will, would like to serve you, the people of Vancouver. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Elizabeth? Thank you. Elizabeth Murphy, and I'm also running with Neighborhoods for Sustainable Vancouver. And I actually I grew up in this neighborhood. I grew up at 37th and Dunbar, and um, I was born and raised in Vancouver, but I, I, this was my, my hood. And I now live in Point Grey. So many of the issues that have come up over the last two terms are, are why I'm, I'm running right now for council. Uh, first, the uh, last term with the MPA, we, we thought that, that Vision was going to be true to the word and, and actually do things differently than the MPA, but we found that in fact, many of the policies that the MPA have previously brought through, the Vision Vancouver have actually implemented. So we want to change that. We want to bring it back to the community level and have neighborhoods more involved in what happens in their neighborhoods so that they can determine the scale and pace of development and growth over time. 
and, and also to ensure that we have the amenities and all of the infrastructure to deal with additional growth in, in a timely manner rather than as an afterthought. So one of the, the false impressions that is being perpetrated is that we, oh sorry, <laughs> sorry I didn't realize I was coming over so much. Anyways, um, thank you very much. NPA team. I do live quite close to here, just down on Lenham Street, and um, really got my start in politics through being the president of Carousel Soccer Club and advocating for more kids on fields and better fields for the kids to play on. The NPA team is running on leadership, on uh, taxes, keeping taxes low, and with the mantra, taxpayers first, always in our minds. We're running on a platform of housing supply, many people coming to Vancouver, so how do we build housing to accommodate those people and keep um, affordability okay in Vancouver, which is always challenging. And we're running on a platform of building a great city, building the streetcar, keeping our community facilities excellent and our cultural facilities excellent. We um, are, want to rebuild the relationship with neighborhoods, which was broken during this last council. We will be supporting the neighborhood committees, working closely with the neighborhoods because the neighbors always know best what works in their own communities. So thank you so much for being here tonight. I look forward to listening to what you have to say. Appreciate Dunbar Residents Association always puts on one of the best attended, excuse me, one of the best attended all Canada's meetings and you've done it again, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ken Charco. Uh, some of you may know me as the theatre guy at the Dunbar Theatre. I'm going to deviate a little bit from my traditional stump speech here. Uh, I've been asked a number of questions about the Dunbar Theatre, so I want to openly answer as many of them as I traditionally get in relation to that building. The Dunbar Theatre is, uh, I think, and a lot of people have told me that, is a community treasure here. I worked with Peggy Schofield, you can see over there, she wrote the book on the Dunbar Theatre. When I say I wrote, she asked me a couple questions. It has the Dunbar Theatre in it. Um, it. In relation to that, yes, uh, Paul Martin used to own it. Uh, we used to work together, I, I approached him. Over 10 years ago, while I was in school, to run it for a summer project before the development was supposed to occur. Uh, I ran it for a few months. I talked to the Martins and uh, they were very kind and we worked out uh, where I was able to keep it for a long period of time and I've had it ever since. Uh, now it's been sold, it's been sold to another company, it's a numbered company as far as I know. I've met the owners and uh, they're very good and they've indicated that as long as I want to be there that they have no plans to develop it. I have no plans to develop it, I want to keep the theatre there. I've recently invested, as an indication of that, a substantial amount of money, uh, both in new chairs, new screen, new technology. The theater revenue has improved every year since I've done that. It's one of the most profitable individual screens in the city. I plan to keep it there. Thank you very much. My name is Ken Charco. Thank you for those introductions. Now we're going to move to the questions that the candidates have received some time ago. Uh, just to remind you, if Councillor Anton has to leave, she does have a prior commitment. Unfortunately, Mayor Robinson couldn't be with us, although we did invite him uh, over a month ago. Um, and uh, with, uh, Sandy um, Garasino, unfortunately, has decided to go down to uh, the Orc the Biltmore rather than join the dialogue in the booze of the Biltmore rather than the dialogue in Dumba. Um, <laughs> So the, uh, the first question, so the, the way I'd like to run this, if I can, is to have um, each party choose one person to answer the questions. We're not here all night. And uh, I'll read the capital plan question, and perhaps either Councillor Woodsworth or Tim Louie could start us off and then run down, Lewis, and then run down the table. Sorry, <laughs> Raymond Louie doesn't like you. Sorry. Should I call you Raymond Lewis to balance it out? Um, and then the next question, the name of my question, how I the question will start with Adrian. I hope that works. So the first, plan, the first question the most you should have in front of you is concerning the capital plan. The capital plan approved by this council will, if completed, spend seven, 702 million in the next three years. Over half of this amount, 391 million, will be borrowed. The city intends to borrow 141 million under its existing borrowing authority, and then ask voters, voters to approve the borrowing of an additional 1.8 million. The capital plan calls for a variety 
capital improvements, including 39 million on parks and 79 million on community facilities. A closer examination reveals that of that 79 million, only 17 million will go to recreation facilities and that no new community centers will be completed from these funds. There are then four questions. If elected, how do you intend to proceed for the additional community to provide for the additional community facilities needed as the city continues to increase its density and experiences additional demand for such facilities? How do you intend to ensure that the existing community centers are maintained and replaced in a timely manner? Would you support the replace, replacement of more than one community center in 2015 to 2017, or is Marple the only one to be replaced in that period? Finally, will you vote to increase the city's debt load in 2014? If so, how much are you prepared to borrow? Those are the four questions on the capital plan, and uh, I think Councillor Woodworth looks like she's going to start us off. I don't know, Councillor Tim Lewis is going to start. Well, those are four very, very great questions. As uh, chair of the Finance Committee for three years, I can assure you that we can do a lot better than one community center every three years. Now there are 22 community centers. One every three years, it'll be 66 years before they all get done. We'll all be done before they're done. <laughs> the money's there, it simply needs to be allocated or reallocated in a wiser way, both in terms of capital and operating. Let me get with operating first off. There is a lot of money spent in areas that I wouldn't necessarily spend it. With no disrespect to the current council, I wouldn't have spent or voted in favor of spending any money on any renovations at 12th and Gamby. That money should be put to work in the neighborhoods where it belongs. Number two, although I'm not uh, one of the impression here that I'm anti-police, I think we've spent enough money on their capital plans, on very, very expensive programs, dispatch systems, and so on. We can be reallocating a very modest amount towards community center facilities, both capital and operating. In terms of our operating, the budget that's the largest, I'm told that my time's up. So uh, I'll leave it at that, but just to reconfirm, it's got to be more than one community center every three years. Thank you. Thank you. Adrian Kahn? That is a great question. Uh, first of all, let me start by saying that I am the Green Party by my uh, incumbent Park Commissioner Stuart McKinnon feel very strongly that our community centers and our community services are the heart of our community, they are the heart of our city, and that we absolutely need to speed up the renewal process. Um, and in fact, uh, not only that, but speed up the process for not just community center renewal, but the parks and the recreation facilities, the libraries that go along with them. The question is, how do you do that? That is your question in here. How do you allocate money in the community plan? Well, one thing I understand is that community center associations have in some cases built up and leveraged some funds that they could have matched to city funds. I think that's a great way. If the community center has done that, I think that's a great way to, to think about moving forward more quickly on the renewal of a, uh, renewal of a center. Um, secondly, you ask a question about debt. I don't believe that we should saddle our children or you as taxpayers with debt. And I do want to just give you one last point, which is I think we need to think about our taxes and what value we get for the taxes and the fact that we need to have that trust that when we pay taxes, we get what we want in our neighborhoods and that we shouldn't fight the notion of having to increase taxes if it's getting what we want. Thank you. So as the current chair of finance for the city of Vancouver, I can tell you that this capital plan went through an extensive process in order to determine how much borrowing that you as taxpayers should be saddled with. At $702 million, uh, the intent is to not have your taxes rise beyond, uh, uh, essentially this capital plan is tax neutral for all of you. 
We could have borrowed more, and we went through consultation with the, with the city, uh, with all of you, we invited everyone to come and give presentations on the capital plan. What we heard was that taxes should be kept low, especially given the tough economic circumstances now. Would I like to see more community centers and more investment into our community centers and libraries and, and other facilities like fire and uh, our police facility that need, needs replacement? Yes. But it needs to be done in a context of keeping our taxes low and our ability to pay. Our AAA credit rating uh, was downgraded as a result of significant pressure economically. And uh, we cannot afford to go down uh, in terms of our, our credit rating further because it increases our borrowing. So the short answer is yes, I would like to see more, but I want to do it in the context of fiscal responsibility as well. Thank you. 60 seconds. Seconds. For, for four questions, okay? Your four sub questions. So I'll be quick. Uh, I think Neighbors for Sustainable Vancouver will have a very different answer. Uh, a few points. One is that because of uh, resistance from the previous councils under COPE Vision and the NPA, the development cost levies paid by developers have not kept up with inflation. Developers are not paying their fair share of the costs of increasing density. They should pay more. Perhaps because they're not paying enough, we're having our land prices escalate because they're getting better deals than they should be. Second thing is that if you look at the Vancouver Courier about two weeks ago, the front page, you'll see an article about uh, Linda or Donna Liberon, who finally got a freedom of information inquiry answered with about uh, 20 or 30 percent of the document still blacked out. But it shows that since 1998, success, successive councils dominated by COPE, Vision, and the NPA have failed to follow about a thousand points that were identified by external consultants on how the city could improve its finances. I, from my review of this document, very briefly, I think that there are millions of dollars that could be saved and that we should be able to uh, save a lot of taxpayers' money and put more money into, into uh, upgrade and repair of community centers. So the real answer is we don't know the full story. I don't think the city is releasing enough information about the financial status. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, as I mentioned, came into politics through good community facilities and it remains central to why I remain in politics. We need to have good community facilities. The uh, community centers are underfunded, the cultural facilities are underfunded. I, the capital plan which I did vote for, somewhat reluctantly, but I voted for it and I encourage you all to vote for it too. I, I say reluctantly because it did not reflect my priorities. My priorities would have been to fund at least one community center in full. The partial funding for Marple was not enough. Uh, we can fund the centers and we can um, increase our community facilities by doing one thing, taking at least one thing away from what Vision is doing. They are pouring money into subsidizing rental housing. I do not support that. Money should be, money which comes from development needs to go into genuine public benefit, genuine public facilities. So that's the first thing I will do. The second thing I will do is make sure that in the next capital plan, it does have much more of a priority on community facilities, on facilities which you need for your families which seniors need, which we all need to make our communities more livable. Thank you. Thank you. We're now moving to the next question on Langway Housing and Adrian will start us off on this round. The question is as follows. In spite of environmental concern about single unit housing, one of the, fir one of the first echo density initiatives was to zone for another single unit house on virtually every single family residence lot in the city. Many homeowners adjacent to or across from these structures are upset, and others fear that there is no planning in place to deal with the increased demands on infrastructure or existing community facilities that come with zoning for three families on one lot, one in the main house, one in the suite, and one in the laneway house. Some builders of laneway houses have been testing novel legal instruments to allow those building and occupying the housing to have an ownership interest in the unit, supporting the observation by some that this, that this is in fact, that this is de facto subdivision. If elected, will you continue to support the uptake of this land use in its current form? Would you expand it to other areas? Would you increase the size of the footprint of these houses? Would you change anything about the current rules? Great, thank you very much. Um, 
it, it would be ridiculous to continue to support this program when there is so much disquiet and unhappiness in communities about it. The first thing is that it was brought in without community consultation. Um, there wasn't buy-in from the communities about what Lingway housing would mean in their communities. Um, secondly, I think we most had a notion that it meant some conversions of garages and some very small units at the backs of some lots, not um, universally applied across the single family residential zones and to the height and density um, that is currently looking like it's expected. So your second question was, would you expand it? No, it's not even working where it's in. Would you increase the size of the footprint? No, I think people are very upset about the story and a half that can go up to and it's the sh shadowing that that incurs and the fact that it, it really does impinge on privacy in the backyards. Would you change anything? Of course. We have to consult with communities. We have to talk to people and make sure that they are happy in their community with the way in which any increased density takes place and then stick to it. Don't do one-off negotiated deals. So the intention of Greenway Housing is to allow for our citizens across our city to live in the neighborhoods that they grew up in and grow old in and provide our citizens more flexibility uh, within their own pres uh, uh, present locations. Uh, perhaps by adding a laneway house or moving into a, na uh, a neighborhood where they could uh, grow old, expand their, or their use by uh, having their in-laws live in that laneway house or use that laneway house as a, a, as a revenue generator for themselves. This uh, is an uh, initiative that was, uh, is not a new one for, for the city. It hasn't existed in a coach house for a period of time. Uh, but our, what I will say is that our density of, within our own houses have decreased over time. And in order to accommodate our children, our future generations, we must uh, provide additional accommodations. Just to answer quickly, would I change this? We're undertaking a review of it. Uh, the expectation is that staff will report back to us early in the next year, and we'll have to, to look at those details at that time, and if, if necessary, to bring down the heights, to uh, make the footprints more small, uh, and un uh, under the current conditions smaller, uh, we would do that. But it's important, I think, for us to give this a chance and understand what all the impacts are before we make those changes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth Murphy with Neighborhoods for Sustainable Vancouver. And uh, Laneway Housing was actually brought in, they did do some so-called consultation, but unfortunately none of the uh, feedback was actually incorporated into what was produced. And instead of doing a real pilot project, which is, they called it a pilot project, but at the same time they rezoned the entire city uh, all of the RS zones, which affects like 70,000 properties. So I think the, the answer is no, uh, it should not continue as it is, that the input that was originally put forward should be reconsidered and also all the ones that have been built should, should be um, evaluated to see what works and what doesn't work and each neighborhood should decide how and what way they want to densify and if they want to have laneway housing as part of that, that program and what it should look like. The, the most important thing that, that they didn't incorporate was using, using laneway housing as an incentive to retain existing buildings. And I think that that's the most important thing if we want to keep the character of our neighborhoods. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to try to get right to the question so you know. In relation to if elected, would you continue to support the uptake of land in its current form? The answer is no. This needs to be uh, reviewed. Uh, we need to take a look at uh, community by community, uh, almost uh, neighborhood by neighborhood, lot by lot. We shouldn't have the same regulations here in Dunbar with smaller lot sizes, smaller laneways, and more of a rustic feel to it that we want in South Vancouver. I was over in South Vancouver and the majority of them want more and larger uh, laneway housing. Here they want to have smaller and more, smaller and more control. We have to come, uh, come away with more, uh, more regulations that we can be able to get consultation in from the different neighborhoods that we have. Uh, would you increase the size of the footprint of these houses? No. 
Uh, would you change anything about the court ru rules? Yes, I would. I would take it so that uh, communities and themselves would have input in that. And if they don't want the laneway housing, they wouldn't have to take the laneway housing. Thank you very much. You don't ask uh, easy questions, do you? <laughs> I think this is a, clearly uh, an issue that has gotten the attention of everybody across the city. Young people are really enthusiastic about it. Uh, builders are really enthusiastic about it. Designers, people who are getting jobs out of it are very enthusiastic. But we started to hear almost immediately that there were real concerns about a particular block, obviously in Point Grey, that was seeing four Langway houses built in that block. When I raised this issue and tried to get a moratorium so that we could review what was happening, I was defeated in council, unfortunately. Because clearly there are some real problems with this. There's the shadowing, there's the privacy issues, there's access to the lane, there's access to the, the question of hooking up to the, uh, the sewage and various, uh, the water that's needed. So there's a lot of really serious questions. It does provide more density, it does provide some rental, and it does provide some housing that people are calling for. So I, I, my concern is I thought we should put a hold on it right away, and instead what's happened is the staff are going away and they're waiting until we've built a little over, I think it's 100 units, and then they're going to be bringing back a review to council. I don't think that's good enough, but that's what's happening right now. I think there's really serious concerns. We have to review it and look at how it works and make sure that it works in a way that it works for the whole neighborhood and provides what the young people and seniors are looking for. Thank you. UBC has for some time been aggressively developing the campus to include more residential units. It recently amended, amended its community plan to provide an even greater density, planning for a total campus year-round population of 35,000, with additional residents during the term time. The recently released plan for the South Campus area calls for 15 towers, up to 22 stories on the South Campus of which nine will define the westerly edge of Pacific Spirit Park. During the amendment process to the community plan, concerns were raised by the adjacent communities of Dunbar and West Point Gray, as well as by those living at UBC itself. Those concerns relate to the impact of the enormous increase in population at UBC and include traffic congestion, parking by staff and students who use the neighborhoods as what are in effect park and ride areas, pressure on daycare, recreational facilities, schools, and the park, that specific uh, spirit park. The City of Vancouver nonetheless supported the amendments to UBC's official community plan with little debate in council. In fact, I think it was 11 o'clock at night that it finally passed, with one speaker myself. If elected, do you intend to continue to support without reservation the build-out on UBC lands? If elected, what position will you take with respect to those to the request of those living on campus for elected democratic representation? Council Lewis. Go ahead. <laughs> um, well, first of all, let me start backwards. I, I believe the UBC's uh, model of governance needs to change. I think that uh, during my time at, on the UBC Joint Committee with Metro Vancouver that uh, we expressed our concerns with them and continue to express concerns about elected representatives and the ability for the students to have better representation as well. But having said that, there is, uh, it is also outside the jurisdiction of the City of Vancouver to tell them exactly. We could give comments. Uh, densification on UBC can make sense, but only if it, we get that transit line at UBC as well. We've been pushing at Envision Vancouver that as our number one priority. We're not interested in creating a streetcar which will take away money that can build that uh, transit line all the way up to UBC in order to provide them the services uh, that they need to get in and out. And that's what our, our main priority is. In terms of the overall densification of the area, they, as long as they build uh, the majority of that housing for students and for their faculty, and uh, rather than move, moving it to a street market system, I'm okay with that. I think that uh, overall the region needs to spread out in terms of its uh, densification, and we need to make sure that we all uh, contribute a little bit of, of opportunity for housing people that are coming here because we cannot uh, stop them from coming. So, thank you. Thank you. 
the brand new earnings for Fox is hard and I'm leaving. But I want you to know that I was here. Uh, thank you. Uh, we, we have an offer of a ride for you, madam, if you'd like to ride. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth Murphy with Neighborhoods for Sustainable Vancouver. And actually, I, I have been involved with this issue because I, I not only grew up in Dunbar, but I also live in Point Grey. And uh, it, it is a, a huge problem with uh, what they're doing out at, at in UBC. I think that in fact, the, the, the way that they try to claim that UBC is an example of sustainable development is actually just the opposite. I think that the, what they're pr producing out there is high density sprawl. Because what, what they've done is they're cutting down green space, putting up high density buildings, but it, it, it's going into green, and into the green zone of, of the park. And, um, and also at the same time, they're, by, they're building high-end, mostly high-end condos that uh, basically students and staff for the most part cannot afford to, to live in. And so then they have their students commuting from basement suites across the, street, the, the city and have to put in a $2 billion um, subway to get them to, com to commute to their, their home. I mean, it's completely backwards. They should be providing student housing out there and we should not be looking at that kind of density without the uh, facilities to, to, to make it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I believe UBC should be part of the city of Vancouver and I would like to see that happen. Now, of course, it's not up to the city to make that decision, so I'm just expressing a personal wish. It's up to the university and up to people at the university to decide what their fate should be, but I do agree that they've got to do something. You can't stay as unorganized territory forever. You need to somehow uh, gain municipal status. Should they build more? It's, I, I don't have an objection to building more per se, but you've got to have the community facilities and you've got to have the transportation. Using Dunbar as a park and ride and Point Grey as a park and ride is not good enough. We need to have the rapid transit uh, going out um, at least the Millennium Line at least to Arbutus and then possibly a streetcar or bus rapid transit up to UBC after that. When those conditions are met, public benefits, public facilities, transportation and schools, then I think it's whether your building is 10 stories high or 12 or 15 stories high, I don't think makes too, too much difference. But you've got to have those pieces that go along with it. By the way, on the streetcar, we can do both. We can build the streetcar right now, which I'm planning once selected. The UBC line will follow in some years' time because we've got to do that evergreen line first out in the Tri-Cities, then we get to the rapid transit in the city of Vancouver. Thank you. When universities rely on and begin to form a dependence on the profits that they make from development to fund the university, they've shifted from what they should be focused on, higher learning, into something they should not be focused on, and that is creating enormous negative impacts on the adjacent communities. So let's get something real clear, real quick. The UBC Board of Governors needs to get back to what they're supposed to be doing, running a university, not trying to play developer. Number two, they need the developers out there to do what developers have always been required to do in Vancouver through community amenity con uh, contributions, CACs, provide the money necessary to build libraries, community centers, neighborhood houses, and so on. None of that is happening at UBC. So, in the five seconds I've got left, answer the first question. Uh, yes, I would be uh, uh, very strongly opposed to any further development there. And number two, they've got to have the ability to elect their own government there, their own government, so that that can be brought to a stop right away. I don't know 
know how many of you were involved in the fight to say you could save UBC Farm, but I was, and I am, and uh, so thank you for doing that because something very precious in our city would have been lost to development of the plans originally as conceived without citizens like you standing up and saying no, there are places that should not be developed uh, that have greater value in their current form. Um, high density sprawl, I love that line, Elizabeth. Um, it's, it's really true that, uh, that somehow there's this mentality that if we just accommodate growth with big high rises, that this is somehow greener. Well, it's not the case. My studying in social geography and urban geography at UBC was that there are limits to that growth. There are tipping points in density that absolutely detract the quality of life, and we have to take those into consideration and not overdevelop. Don't overdevelop. I live in the West End. I know of which I speak. Um, third, regarding um, the development out there in the associated services. Where has, in our livable city plan, where has gone this notion of complete neighborhoods? There aren't the shopping facilities and all the associated transit and community facilities needed to support that kind of density. We need to rethink where we are putting density in some modest form that is already in association with services that we have and then upgrade those services to make sure that they can be supplied to people. And your final point, election. I don't know how many of you caught um, my press conference that I did with an Area A representative um, or candidate, Alexandra Mitchell, young woman, I'm quite impressed, um, who uh, wanted to get an actual voting seat for Area A on TransLink board. Do you know that they have the second largest density of people traveling to uh, and transit use and no direct elected representation? That's wrong. Thank you. Concerns council hearings and public consultation, and maybe the sustainable Vancouver will start us off on this one. Rumors abound that the majority on this and previous council met before public hearings in order to decide the result before the hearing took place. The voting record would certainly substantiate those rumors. The result is that the public hearing process would seem to be a waste of citizens' time and effort. If elected, what would you do to restore faith in the public hearing process? And secondly, if elected, will you vote as a bloc with your fellow party members? Maybe, or Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Okay, I'll take the second the second question first. We would not vote as a bloc. Each member of NSV would be free to vote according to their conscience. Uh, and in con that's in contrast to the most recent council. If you check uh, www.vancouvercouncilvotes.wordpress.com, you'll see a database of about 50 critical neighborhood votes in which Vision Vancouver voted virtually as a bloc, and almost in every case against the dominant wishes of the community. And the first question is, uh, what would we do to restore faith in the public hearing process? In contrast to the recent council's adoption of the regional growth strategy under Metro Vancouver and the STIR program and other programs and policies adopted with no or virtually no public consultation, uh, we will make sure that there is good public consultation. And um, I would, as the mayor, I would like to reinforce to all the city staff, the public service, that the code of conduct requires all public servants to first of all serve the public interest. And my question every morning to the staff would be, will every word and action that you do enhance the public trust? If not, don't do it. Thank you. Ken Chalker. Oh, hello, thank you. Uh, I want to start off by just acknowledging some of my colleagues that are present today. Uh, we got Casey Crawford running uh, for Parks Board back there, and Bill McCurry, uh, council candidate. Thank you, I uh, want to acknowledge them. Uh, I also want to make it clear about the NPA. Uh, we're not a party, we're an association. So in answer to whether or not we'll be voting as a bloc, the answer is no. Uh, we will not, we'll have a great, in our caucus meetings right now, everyone disagrees all the time, and I'm sure on council you will see a lot of votes where we do disagree. In relation to uh, um, what would you do to restore the faith in the um, public hearing process, is again, we would listen to the community and individual votes, and we wouldn't be voting as a party, more as an association. All right, thank you very much.
I think the first thing that we need to do to restore public confidence is we need to take developer money out of party politics. does not take contributions from the corporations, and I don't think that we should, any party should be doing that. I think we need a ward system so that people can run as independents, or if they want to run with a neighborhood association or whatever, they, but there should be transparency, and I tripped, uh, chaired a cross-party uh, committee that looked at electoral reform. Unfortunately, the provincial government decided to not include most of it. Secondly, I think that clearly Councillor David Cat and I, both from COPE, did not vote the same way on many different issues. We thought about what the public was saying, considered it carefully, and made our own decisions of how we were voting. Thirdly, I think that the public really needs to have proper community consultations before we get to public hearings, not just where you go around looking at billboards, where, where there was a discussion like this with the community about the project so everyone's well informed before it comes to council. And I think that these are three min minimal things that we could do to make sure that people restore or feel like the public process is a fair public process because it's critical to democracy that you do come before council and that we listen clearly to what you say before we vote. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, I absolutely believe that uh, the public process, the way it's working, input process, the way it's working now, is not working. Um, when people feel that their concerns are being disregarded, when the vast, vast majority of people coming out to a hearing, staying up sometimes till two in the morning uh, to, to get through their speaking order, and they're almost unanimous, get ignored, it's not working. Um, so the first thing that has to happen is, a restoration of faith, trust, and involvement of citizens in a process where their wishes are being respected. And it's not, I have heard people in the current council say, oh, well, they're just a special interest group. They're everyone who came up in that community. No one else did. Those are the people you have to listen to. It's not some other group that didn't show up. Um, secondly, it's really critical uh, that, uh, that you don't, that, that council sticks to the community plans where people have been involved and determined their wishes and not do this one-off stir program-like negotiations which are bad public policy because they do not adhere to the community plan where community residence issues are represented. Finally, on the last point, it's really critical that you know about me, that I will put public interest first in every decision, and that I guess I will attempt to vote with myself. <laughs> so <laughs> if I'm one green on the, on the ballot. But that I think that it's time to break down the partisanship. It's time to work on what are the best issues and try and reach some kind of agreement and improve those issues, dropping the partisan party labels. Well, I can tell you that every vote that I vote on, I consider it on an individual basis, and I always vote my conscience on what I believe to be the best interests of our citizens, based on the best information that I have and based on the presentations that come before me. In order for us to uh, remove that perception that there's bias and, and uh, in terms of process or in terms of outcomes, I think it is important for us to remove the, uh, the large influence from a number of uh, influences. Developers is one. Unions are another. And putting, uh, setting, uh, spending limits as well. We tried to do this last term. Uh, there, was, there was opposition and it did not happen under the NBA. Councillor Anton did vote against that. And so we will continue to try to, to convince the provincial government who refused our request this time at UBCM to remove both developers, unions, and set limits on spending within the city of Vancouver. We do need to change the, the process uh, that we do consultation. Clearly, it's not working as well as it, uh, as it should. And the intention is for us to do more planning prior to any development occurring. That's why we've implemented for the first time three planning areas in the city of Vancouver. And during that planning process, there will be no development except for exceptional circumstances. Like, for instance, the provincial government says, let's build social housing and we've got a pile of money for you. Those would be the exceptional circumstances. So my, my time is up, sorry. Thank you. And our final question 
question five, and perhaps the MP will start us off on this one. Mr. Zan will start us off, and I'll read the question first. New residents at 16th and Dunbar. The new 51 unit supportive housing project at 16th and Dunbar is ready for occupancy. An operational management plan for this unit was created with community input as a condition of the development permit. Recent remarks on the part of one councillor and the mayor have suggested that they, those terms may come under the direct control of council. And this was the comment that there were not enough people, homeless people, being directly placed into that unit. What is your position on honouring this community agreement, and what do you feel, um, and what do you feel that such comments imply for the value of citizens giving time and effort to help ensure that such a project is a success, successful venture? Secondly. If elected, will you support council taking control of the placement of tenants in supportive housing units by council? Thank you very much. I would like to first of all thank all the community members who have been so engaged in the committee to work with Coast Mental Health to make sure that the building at 16th and Dunbar fits in the community. And I, I know that your community, this community is very active right now in welcoming the new residents of that building. So I, I just think that that is so wonderful for the new people coming and I, I really thank everybody who's been involved in that. And I'm sure there's many people in this room who have been. The, uh, uh, the tenanting of the building is done under a joint committee. It is not a political process. It's done under the, under the terms of the Memorandum of Understanding that was signed about four years ago now uh, between the previous NPA Council and the provincial government and other entities. That Memorandum of Understanding continues and I personally certainly will be living under the terms of that Memorandum of Understanding. It's not for politicians to interfere when these agreements are in place and I think that the agreement was for a tenant mix that I think everybody thought would be a good one. Um, there is an emphasis and something I am most interested in on people who live in this neighborhood being able to be in that building and certainly there are homeless people in this neighborhood. The homeless who go into that building should be the homeless from this area because they do, people want to stay in their own neighborhoods. Uh, whether they have homes or homeless, they do want to stay in their own neighborhoods. And so obviously that's very important. So thank you. Um, I think all of us will look forward to seeing the building opening. And uh, quite um, interesting to see how it develops. We do need social housing all around the city. And this is a real model for how that can be done. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to echo some of the uh, comments you've already heard from others. We all have family members that have mental illness. There isn't a family in Vancouver that doesn't have one member at some level or another with mental illness. One of the very sad facts of life is that many, many homeless people are in fact mentally ill. The downsizing of Riverview was done in, in, a, in a terrible way, and a lot of people that were accommodated are living on our streets. One of the ways to address that is to create facilities for people with mental illnesses. Now, I will tell you, I cannot understand, if it's true, I cannot understand why the mayor or anybody else on council would be suggesting that council take control of this facility. There may be something I'm unaware of. If there's an operational management plan at OMB that the community developed with all of the stakeholders, I'm absolutely committed to maintaining that OMB. If I've understood correctly, the community invested hundreds of hours developing that plan, and that plan should be honored. I'd be very, very receptive to any feedback from anybody here on that, but that's my take on it, not knowing all the background and all of the detail. Let's build more social housing for people with mental illnesses, but let's do it in partnership with our neighborhoods and our communities. Thank you. honor the commitment that was made to the community here and honor the involvement um, of people in the process to have such a housing uh, 
um, development project in your community because I think it is having those projects throughout the city that create stronger community in the end. Um, so no interference from City Council on this. This, was a, this went through a process, my understanding. I would want to read more if it came up again at the council table um, to be thoroughly informed, but went through a process, there was an agreement, there is an MOU, it is not for council to interfere in that this is a professional decision. As an aside, I just want to let you know that um, I, like Tim, I'm totally aware that there is not a family untouched, including my own, by mental illness. Um, that uh, I, and I do volunteer fundraise for Stand Up for Mental Health. I think it's an issue that needs to be openly and, and um, warmly discussed by community. Um, and that I think that uh, professionals would say that it is not a unit. Um, housing should not just accommodate people with one set of challenges. The mixture is what's really important for those people to help each other and the community to, uh, to help uh, and, to be, and to fit with the community as well. So it's what's best for them and what's best for the community. Thank you. Okay. So thank you for the question. I've had a bit of benefit of com uh, communications with uh, Jane on this as well. And, uh, I was hoping to get a bit of inf more information of where this comment uh, is derived at because we uh, recently spoke of this issue in council and uh, unanimously we approved of the continuing tenanting process that uh, is already in place. The committee uh, has the job to do and uh, we intend to honor that but there's no indication uh, from council at all of interfering with that, that process given that it's a, as Councillor Anton was saying, it's not a political issue, it's not the intent of council to, to interfere with the work that has already been uh, uh, done by the committee uh, and uh, subscribed to uh, by all of council and directed as part of the MO so this is a, a, an important issue for us across our city and we need to make sure that uh, uh, the needs of our citizens are addressed and it needs to be respectful to each of the neighborhoods as well. Thank you. Elizabeth Murphy. Thank you. So yes, uh, again, I, I also echo the fact that if there is a memorandum of understanding and an agreement between the community and the city and the provider that that should be honored and it's not for the city to be messing in that. Uh, if there were some issues that, that come up as the um, building is occupied and as things go down the road and if the community comes forward with some issues that weren't anticipated and that we need to discuss and we have to address those things. But for the council to, before they've even occupied the, the buildings and before it's even up and going to be already circumventing a, a memor memorandum of understanding, I think that that is uh, wrong and fundamentally should uh, not take place. Thank you. with those difficult questions. And we now move to the next phase of this, which is that uh, as you've been coming in, some of you have been writing questions on cards which we've collected. And uh, these questions have been directed to specific councillors or for me to assign to a councillor. Um, we will go through these, and uh, when time allows, then we'll move to an open mic for question period. So the first question I have for councillor Louis is the following. The Vancouver hiking and biking public is still waiting for the Fraser River Trail in front of Marine Drive Golf Course to be built, and at last connected up to the walkways in Marple's Fraser River Park and the new Bus Barn Trail. What will be your immediate plans to complete this riverfront section of Vancouver's much-loved walking trail? And again, in one minute time. One minute. Well, it, it is, in fact, uh, a platform of Vision Vancouver to increase the hiking and walking trails and to make our waterfront more accessible. And this is a priority for Vision Vancouver to make that happen. It is held up by a uh, privately held piece of land, and we intend to continue to put pressure on that, uh, that uh, landowner in order to open up that, that section for the enjoyment and use of all of our citizens. But it, is, uh, it will come down to us uh, making some funding, perhaps, or leveraging them in order to make it happen, but uh, we in intend to uh, provide that uh, pressure in an ongoing way and improve the rest of our green space in our city as well. Thank you. The next question is for Councillor Woodsworth. 
Some years ago, the zoning regulations changed to encourage better design in keeping with the character of the neighboring homes. There was a bonus for building using this design choice. Today, we see developers using this bonusing to build homes that maximize the housing size or reducing the yard to its barest minimum. This would seem to counter the effects to green Vancouver. Would you be prepared to review and amend the allowable FSR to make these conditions conditional rather than outright? Well, I think this council obviously has been very, very committed to the green agenda and to making Vancouver the greenest city in the world by 2020. And we are number two in North America right now. And it seems to me any way that we can learn from the citizens and learn from ideas around the world, such as ideas like this, we should consider them and implement them because there we we are in a very difficult situation. I think that the fact is that there the young people are now Occupy. We're raising environmental concerns as number the one concern. It's unfortunately it's disintegrated into a discussion about the tents when I think that we're known for a city that wants to tackle this one and I appreciate the idea coming forward and I would appreciate whoever gave the question in if they email me the specifics so that I could start working on it right away. Thank you. The next question was directed to Councillor Anton so I think can you get it? The question is do you believe that the wireless smart meter program should be stopped based on recent moratorium requests and an independent inquiry with full public hearings? If not, why not? Um, I want to make sure there's uh, possibly two that uh, it's the wireless smart meters in relation to BC Hydro. Uh, that is privately funded uh, through BC Hydro. And uh, that for which, uh, as a city councillor, uh, I don't have too much to say in. But as it relates to the water meter programming, is that we are opposed to the water meter programming, which I think it might be referring to. Uh, it's a, we find uh, the MK's position that to spend $25 million uh, would be much better spent on water conservation and upgrading of our water system than having water meters inside the houses. All right, thank you very much. Would you promote greater use of biomass energy technologies to create revenues for schools and parks? I think that we really do need to create energies which are alternative green and uh, low polluting which is, of course, inherent in the word green. The use of biomass energies does, to some degree, uh, relate to uh, burning and an incinerator. Of, it's not waste, but it is biomass fuel. Um, it's controversial. I have actually seen a biomass plant up in Prince George, at the University of Prince George, that had extraordinarily low emissions. And I think it's worth exploring. I think you've got to have public hearings. Uh, on it. Um, we need to um, fast track in the goal towards zero waste, the handling of food scraps, although it's being done and implemented at a, in the single family zones, it's not in the apartment buildings and it absolutely needs to be. It's a huge problem in terms of waste management. Um, so I would not support incineration of uh, waste stream, but I think it's worth looking into biomass energy. Thank you. A question for Randy Hilton. We talk about greener city and sustainability. I observe that when livable old homes in my neighborhood are redeveloped, they are first turned into a pile of rubble. What would you do to ensure that valuable construction materials are recaptured and recycled rather than carted off to the dump? Well, uh, I believe Metro Vancouver seems to be doing some work on that. They've been discussing ways to recycle uh, metal, wood, and other material materials in, uh, in buildings. So I think, in principle, I would be very strongly uh, supportive of any effort to recycle building materials 
if the demolition has to happen, and it requires cooperation with uh, other governments in the region and Metro Vancouver. But uh, the recent government, the, the current council, just approved uh, giving permission to demolish buildings before development applications are approved. And we would actually like to see that reversed so that buildings cannot be demolished until a development application is uh, approved. This would allow more opportunity to review the uh, heritage protection and other ways to use existing buildings. In many ways, buildings that are still standing are more environmentally friendly than destroying them and rebuilding. Thank you. The next question is to Tim Lewis. Why is it taking so long to, mod to modify elevators at SkyTrain stations? It's taken six, three months to modify into Iran and six months in other places. I'll give you a very short answer. I don't know. <laughs> I'll give you this because I like a bit closer. If I'm elected, I'll get on it right away and find out why it's taking so long. I do know this. TransLink is not accountable. And the reason TransLink is not accountable is because this board is not elected. And one of my number one commitments if I'm elected to city council is to democratize TransLink. Yeah. Once, once we democratize TransLink, elevators will be such a quick item to solve that you'll have forgotten about it in the blink of an eye and we'll do with all of TransLink from top to bottom. Thank you. generations to be able to, to live here and all that kind of stuff too but I think one of the biggest problems that we have right now in Vancouver is land value and that is really what is driving the costs of, uh, of housing and as long as the council keeps coming up with these planning programs that, that dangle up, up zoning um, it, it, it keeps the um, inflationary process of, of speculation in land value, which makes it worse. So I think what we have to do is get back to neighborhood-based planning processes so that every neighborhood can decide how they want to accommodate all the different forms of, of uh, housing that they need, and in various different forms, including some that are, are, are more affordable. Thank you. The next question is for um, Ken Charco. The city planted over 300,000 trees this year, but doesn't have the money to care for the ones we have. The Parks Board has no money to spray with safer soap at the Heritage Red Oaks along Blenheim Street, and as a consequence, they are infested with the Red Oak Skeletonizer. There is evidence to indicate that, it is, that this is not just an inconvenience for residents. This pest can weaken the trees over time and shorten their lifespan. If elected, will you work to restore the Parks Board budget to allow maintenance of our heritage trees and other green spaces? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, first and foremost, if elected, uh, one of the major things that we're going to be doing as an MPA is having a clear uh, distinction between council and parks board. And uh, parks board has to be autonomous in the decisions that they make, and they have not, they should not be uh, having any influence. Council should not have any influence over what parks board would do. And the only part that council should play in that is to make sure that they have <coughs> adequate funding to be able to do the things that they do. And 
those parks board is fundamentally to what everyone needs here. I've been to the community center up here many a time. Uh, Susan Anton, she started here uh, dealing with the, the parks, so we're going to have a real strong commitment to that and to dealing with these issues with the NPA Council. Thank you. The next question is for Councillor Woodsworth. Would you allow low-cost, 99-year leases to housing co-ops to develop unused city property? Well, I think the question is, do we think co-op housing is a good form of housing? And absolutely, it's a great form of housing. And unfortunately, the federal government stepped out of providing funding for co-op housing in about 1993. We have to get the federal government back at the table to work with the city to develop co-op housing. Yes, I'm in favor of us using city land to develop co-op housing, but we need to work with nonprofits to do that. We could look at equity co-ops, and we could look at street to home and other organizations to see if they'd like to partner with us. But fundamentally, we're sick and tired of the federal and provincial government downloading onto the cities, things that they're supposed to be helping help care. We're the only G8 country in the world without a national housing program, and this is a key component of that. Thanks for the question. We have another question for Adrian Carr. What is your position on exposing children and teachers in schools to Wi-Fi and other wireless microwave radiation communications? Technology now classified by the World Health Organization as a cancer risk, and Health Canada has posted the need for reduced use for children. That's a tough one, you know, because I use Wi-Fi, and I think most of us probably do in this room. Yet the health uh, studies are increasingly showing that there is risk. Um, and therefore, I think that we should re-examine policies of moving to Wi-Fi in schools and in community at large. Um, I think our health, we have to be preventative in terms of health impacts. I think there's enough evidence mounting for us to take that, take that study. We have, as a Green Party, opposed um, the positioning of any Wi-Fi towers um, on any schools. Um, they have been proposed on here, but in other municipalities, and uh, we think that's absolutely the wrong way to go. Um, that's okay. Fine. I could talk further about other Wi-Fi things, and, and the, the, I'm tempted to go into the smart meters, but I think I'll leave it to, to conversation afterwards. Thank you. Question, question for Randy Hilton. What do you think of the idea of making Vancouver the most accessible city? As we have a larger portion of the population aging and the numbers of people with disabilities will increase, what would you do to focus staff and the community to achieve this goal? Well, first of all, I, I strongly support making Vancouver a very accessible city for everyone. And uh, the first, most important thing is to make is to make a commitment as as a city to do this, uh, and will be translated into efforts right at the street level. For example, there are experts who will walk with you through a community. I've met I've met some of these people. They will walk through a community with expert eyes and look at all of the, uh, the curbs, uh, all of the steps, and all of the access points and help us. So um, this I just had very short time to prepare my thoughts on this, but I would for sure like to see uh, a systematic way of going through every single neighborhood in the city with experts, working with community groups, and reviewing the accessibility of the buildings and the, uh, the streets and sidewalks. And I also, going back to this services review, I believe that there are millions of dollars of savings that could be found if this thousand points of improvements was actually released properly to the public for everyone to see how we can save money. And I think we could find money for these kind of expenses. Thank you. This is the final written question, and it is to all candidates. So we have time for you to all answer if you wish to, or if you wish to pass, that's fine too. I don't know if I dare let you to let you just jump in, or whether I should start at one end and move down. Maybe I'll start here and move down. <laughs> um, the question is as follows: the ward system. Were you for or against implementing the ward system? Why? In other words, would you explain your previous position on the board position, the board's question? And if
if your position has changed since the ward system was first proposed in Vancouver, why has your position changed? Do you understand this one, Kim? Absolutely. Good question again. Welcome to the Dunbar debate. Thank you. Uh, the ward system is, my, my thoughts have always been uh, basically the same, and I'll let you know at the end exactly where I stand on that. But we have to respect the process that's been done there. We, we did have a, a group of citizens that were picked at large to be able to take a look at our electoral reform, reforms, and they gave suggestions to the government on which way we should be able to do that. Now, having said that, my opinion on what we need to be able to do here is not to completely throw out the at-large system and uh, correct all the, the shortcomings that that has and completely replace it with a ward system that has not those shortcomings, but a whole bunch of new shortcomings. So what I would suggest and what I've heard from talking to thousands of people during their electoral process is to do a hybrid of the two, where we'd have uh, five ward systems that would be able to represent the communities, and then five at large. So then you'd be able to get the best of both worlds, worlds and hopefully cut down on the difficulties of both. Thank you very much. And uh, once we finish this question, just so that you know, we will be taking questions from the mic, and you may direct them at one or all candidates after we've been through this board question. question. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth Murphy with Neighborhoods for Sustainable Vancouver. And yes, our position on the wards is that uh, we also support either a ward system or a partial ward or looking at some other form of, of neighborhood representation of some kind. And it, it has become very evident to me ever since I first got involved with um, the neighborhood issues uh, about um, uh, four and a half years ago that the, one of the biggest problems is that we, we don't have proper representation on, at the local level and everything is far too top down so we need to reassess how that's done. Thank you. Yeah, if you want to, well, you can pass it, but Benny summarized it. Well, just 15 seconds, yeah, I, I think that there should be a good review of the options. There are the pros and cons of every form, and the ward system may not be absolutely perfect, but the most important thing is to have a good public discussion so that whatever we choose as a society and a city is something that people really feel comfortable with. So we would be really committed to having a good public discussion on that. Thank you. Thank you. So, just to disclose, I voted for the ward system. It was my uh, during my first term on council that we implemented the uh, referendum on the ward system, and I believe the ward system is superior to the at-large system because it provides accountability for those elected. Each of us that are elected will be accountable, and you know exactly who to go to. Having said that, there is some benefit, uh, I'd say, to an at-large system for the longer-term horizon, larger projects where it requires uh, co greater cooperation from all of the council members. But in, the, in this day and age of, of uh, situations where it gets too parochial, and you know, Toronto is an example of where I think it perhaps isn't working as well as it might, a, a proportional representation model is what I would prefer to have happen here in Vancouver, if we could ever get there. The province uh, uh, hasn't uh, moved in, in that direction for us, and it's not a system uh, that, they, that, that went through a referendum. It's not a true proportional representation system. So uh, until we get there, uh, we, we live with what we've got, but I'd like it to change and obviously give better representation, direct representation to our neighborhoods. Some of you may remember that in 2002, following the provincial election of 2001, in which I was the, the elected Green Party BC leader, first one on the debates, I actually initiated the Citizens Initiative under the Recall and Initiative Act for proportional representation in BC. So I did an initiative as a citizen. We gathered 98,000 signatures, 4,000 canvases throughout the province, and after the end of that, um, one month later, uh, the Citizens Assembly was, was established in British Columbia. I'm a great believer in reforming our voting system because too many people right now believe that their vote doesn't count. Well, in fact, it doesn't. Too many people's votes simply does, do, don't count towards representation, which, especially amongst youth, leads to a real disenchantment with even voting at all, consequentially low voter turnout. 
Um, the ward system does not increase proportionality. It does not increase the chance that your vote will count. There may be some fairness in terms of neighborhood representation, but I would absolutely favor a system at the local level that would include proportionality so that everybody feels that in the end, they do get the representation they voted for. Thank you very much. We did have a referendum on it. Uh, retired Chief Justice Thomas Berger did a very good report. He recommended 14 wards in the city. I think we do need to have a ward system. I've discussed this with many different people. Nobody can figure out what STD stands for, proportional representation, or all any of these other things. Everybody understands what a ward system means. A ward system means people can get elected. They don't need the big developers' money to get even visible in the city in an election. It means neighborhoods can elect people from those neighborhoods that are accountable and that represent the work that has been done in the neighborhood. I was just talking to Dr. Singh in the South Asian community. He said year after year after year, South Asian people try to run, try to get elected, and they can't get elected because there's still bias in the city. If there was a ward system, they could be assured they'd have rep adequate representation. These are just some of the problems that we're seeing is that would be addressed under a ward system. We would have a ward system today if uh, Larry Campbell had actually fought for what he said he would fight for, which was a ward system. And we should know what Sam Sullivan spent in fighting to stop the ward referendum from passing, and we still don't know what he spent. So these are some of the questions that we have to still find answers to, but I'm very convinced a ward system with five at large that would represent us at the Metro Board would be a very good way to democratize and engage citizens. Thank you. And the last, uh, the last phase of this uh, session to Tim Lewis on the ward system. I'm very proud of the fact I voted in favor of wards. Prior to that referendum, I voted in favor of the city hiring retired Judge Berger, a very, very wise man who held public hearings throughout the entire city of Vancouver before making his recommendations. You know, we have a ward system. Federally, we elect our MPs by writings or wards. We have a ward system provincially, same idea. The reason voter turnout in the city of Vancouver is 31% and dropping is because it must be almost impossible to do due diligence on all the people running in an at-large system. I quite frankly don't know how on earth to do it. Park Board, School Board Council, there are over 120 people seeking your support. For you to do due diligence on each of them and then remember and pick 10 councillors and nine school trustees and seven park commissioners, it would have to give you a headache. So let's have a ward system where you pick one park commissioner, one school trustee, and one city councillor, and if you don't like what they're doing for you, you can get rid of them. If everybody's responsible, nobody's responsible. And that's the way it works right now at City Hall. 11 people, they don't point their fingers at somebody else when you're not happy. This would give you one person to point your finger at. So I'm in favor of ward systems. We're now moving to the uh, uh, opportunity to ask questions from the mic, and I would like to let everyone know that I see some other candidates in the room. I think uh, this is uh, this Terry Martin standing up there at the, uh, at the mic. I still see Phil McCleary over there, Maureen Kirchham, Blake Wade, um, Ella Hathaway, I think, is here. Uh, Bria Pritt-Paul is here. Um, and so if you have questions for the people um, on the panel or even perhaps some of the others, uh, please step forward to the microphone. And Terry's going to start us off. Yes, uh, I want to ask a question about, uh, it's actually a two-part question, but um, it's something that I was very involved in for a very long time and is very dear to my heart, and my question is to Raymond Louis. In the uh, last election campaign, the entire Vision Slate and the mayor said they were in favor of reinstating third-party appeals in the city of Vancouver to the Board of Variants. Uh, nobody said they would look at it. They said clearly they were in favor. Now, when I asked this question of Jeff Meggs, he said, well, we said we'd look at it, and I decided it wasn't good. But I want the, the real answer from you. My two-part question is this. You promised in the last election campaign to reinstate third-party appeals. Your entire party did. When the Board of Variants bylaw came up for discussion, 
uh, we were told clearly that we would not even be discussing third party appeals. And then later in the term, I'm told that the division majority decided to not reinstate third party appeals to the Board of Variance. My two part question is this. Number one, why did you represent yourself in that way and then not do what you were said? My second part of my question is, because of your record on that, why should I believe what you tell me now is what you're going to do in the next term? This, this issue is really important because third party appeals is a right we have for 50 years in Vancouver and was lost. We were promised it would be returned by your party and you didn't do it. Thank you. I think we have a question. Does everyone have a question? Councilor? Thank you. Thank you, Terry. That's a very legitimate question in terms of third party appeals, something that uh, I, I believe that uh, is still available, but in a very limited fashion. And so the definition of third party appeals is, uh, that came down from the courts, define the difference between those that are impacted and those that are affected. And so what we went through was a court decision that came down from, from uh, the judicial system that uh, interpreted where our charter rights lay, and that's what we based our decision on. And after the process, uh, certainly we, we still believe that uh, those that are uh, directly uh, affected uh, should have that right to go through that process, but this was the, this was the process that uh, we went through. The second part of your question is, would you, uh, I'll answer in the form of a question, would you want your elected officials to look at the best information possible? Or do you want your elected officials to answer every question positively without, and stick, stick to that answer despite new information coming forward? Do you want your elected officials to consider all the best information that they have available after asking staff and our legal system and our legal staff how to proceed and consider that new information or stick just with what you, what you said? My preference is that I would like our elected officials to look at the best information. And that's what I did. And I'm sorry uh, for, for uh, the, the, the nuanced difference between what the, the court says and certainly the, that's, but that's not of my making in terms of what the judicial review uh, yielded in terms of uh, its opinion for, for what the city could and should do as well. Thank you. The next question is from Terry. I'm afraid Terry... I really don't, don't feel my question was answered. You are Three acres, the value is $10 million. Let's, yes or no, would you have, if you were elected, have this three acres put into supportive housing in the community of Sosos? One of the panel like to answer that question. I think it was directed generally. All right, well, every neighbor in Vancouver, so with regard to Southlands, yes, Southlands should have supportive housing. Now, I don't know the particular lot that you're talking about, so I'm sorry, I cannot give you my word, because whenever I give my word, I keep my word, I cannot give you my word that the particular lot that the city owns in Southlands should be the site. It may not be the best site, I don't know. But I do know this, if Southlands is, as you say, they don't have supportive housing, then there's something wrong. They're not carrying their fair share, and I would make absolutely certain that Southlands and Shaughnessy and Terrasdale and, and Tinsalina Marlet, every neighborhood has supportive housing. That's how it works. Maybe maybe two more. I'm a little concerned if we run them all the way down. Yes, Aiden wants to respond to that question as well. Okay, well, yes, just very, very quickly. Um, I absolutely agree with Tim, and I stated before, um, it's about having it, every neighborhood having, not just um, carrying its fair share, but actually having the opportunity and uh, to have people within the community living close to family and, uh, you know, with, with the history that they've got in that community. So one question I have is, I feel very strongly um, that land that is agricultural capacity needs to be preserved. I do not know the zoning of that land, and I would like to look into that because I think we have precious little agricultural land left in the city. Now, now Adrian's up. Does any other candidate want to ask that question, or should we move to the next one? Just very short. Yeah, we'll move on. And we, uh, um, we welcome Bill McLean, who's had a sixth change and is now going to sit in for Susan and Tom. Okay. Sorry. 
<laughs> Jane, if I could just take just a sec to ask for Terry's uh, question. It, it's a simple answer. It's every neighborhood needs to, to um, have social housing in it, supportive housing in it, and we need to spread the burden that, uh, uh, of building that into every, every corner of our city to make sure that it will serve the people's needs as best we can. Thank you. We have 20 minutes for questions from the floor, and I see we have already seven or eight people lining up. So when you ask your question, if you could direct it to one or more uh, people, so it's clear who the question is directed to, each one, to one, so perhaps you could tell them. Okay, so my question then is directed to anybody who can justify the transfer of property taxes from business to residences. I know the NPA and Visions are in favour and they continue to transfer property taxes at 1% a year. And in fact, I believe the NPA says it should continue ad, ad nauseum. Now my question is then, Given the fact that the businesses in Dunbar, including the banks and Starbucks and the other uh, small businesses, are now transferring their property taxes to citizens here, it has two side effects. One, they're allowed to deduct any of their expenses from the taxes they pay. I'm not allowed to deduct my property taxes on my income tax. I bought a house here 25 years ago for 200,000. All right? Now it's assessed at 1.7 million. And I've just got a, a little lot down here on Highbury and 16th. Now, anybody who builds a house in my block that they get assessed for $2 million, my taxes go up. It's reached the point now that we're retired, we can't afford to pay our property taxes. If it wasn't for the fact that the NDP passed a law that allows seniors to defer their taxes until they die, we wouldn't be allowed to stay in the house. So I, don't, I, don't, I want anybody here to justify how they can continue moving property taxes from business to private citizens. So first. Uh, thank you very much for the question. I'll explain it in a couple different ways. Uh, uh, from a personal point of view, uh, my property taxes uh, for the Dunbar Theatre, uh, about eight, nine years ago, were roughly around $20,000, and now they're well over $50,000. Uh, I've met with the representative of the Fair, uh, Fair Tax Coalition, which includes, is headed by Leonard Schein, who owns the uh, Fifth Ave, the park, and the, uh, the Ridge Theatre. And uh, I took a look at their proposal and the numbers that they crunched and how they presented it to me and, and argued for the, the shift nation basically comes in this way. It's to help you eventually get lower taxes. And why that is, and this is very important, I'm gonna to try to explain it in a minute, I'll be a little over here, is businesses consume 35 cents of every dollar they give in taxes. Condos consume 1.5 thereabouts worth of services for every dollar they put in. So a plan in the city where we only make condos makes us have to, single family residents, have to pay more taxes. But if we encourage those small businesses in there to come to the city, like for example, when, when you had Pixar come to the city, they're, they're giving, let's say, $50,000 worth of taxes, but they're only consuming 20,000. They have, they can land at any municipality they want to be able to do that. And right now, we're paying roughly uh, seven times the residential property tax, the highest in Canada for business taxes. Where if you go to Surrey or you just go to Burnaby, you're only paying around four times. So we want to encourage those businesses there so that our property taxes will eventually go down. What I would do in making a change is work with the provincial government to allow us to give the, uh, the legislative ability within City Hall to direct it to those small uh, companies coming in, which we can't do right now. So the ideal situation is to work with the uh, provincial government to make sure we can, we can direct it to small businesses, we can direct it to arts companies, we can direct it to uh, like Fifth Ave or the park or the playhouse or the Rio theater or the bookstore that we want in here or the individual co coffee shop as opposed to the large large multinationals. I hope that explained your position there. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. That is a, I think Councillor Louis is going to jump in here with perhaps less of the explanation. 
You mean I can't go over it just a little bit? No, you're, you're a city council. You're meant to be good at this. So the short answer is Vision Vancouver disagrees with the MBA's position. If you want an extra 6% layered on to your residential property taxes, then you vote for the MBA. That's the bottom line. They will continue on with this tax shift. Vision Vancouver will not be continuing on. We, there is a half a percent shift that's left in a five-year plan that was written by Stanley Hamilton. We've completed that once we get that last little bit set done, and then we will not continue on. This is a, a very simple answer to your question. The, the extra 6% is on top of, we just did an analysis of what the MPA's promises are in terms of 400, extra $400 million worth of capital, another $10 million worth of expenditure. So when they say they're going to keep their taxes to the rate of inflation, they're only, the only way that they can do it is by cutting services and they're not telling us what they're cutting. So the MPA's position is an extra 6% as a result of this tax shift and we're not going to go there. Thank you. Um, you know, I really, I really believe our communities are rooted around the services and the open spaces and the stores that we have there. And it's not the Starbucks. It's those little stores that are diverse, that are independently owned. And I think it's extremely important that we keep them in the city. So, this is not a popular stand, I can tell. And I have been informed by lots of people in small business that they're hurting enough so that they're shutting down. And you've seen the empty stores in your communities. We have to stop that from happening. I think we all want that diversity of stores that give us our neighborhood character. So the tax shift is a little hard to swallow, but I think we've got to continue it. And I've talked to people in the small business community that it, yes, there is a deduction to their tax, that they can deduct part of, the, uh, part of it. And by the way, you should be very clear, the banks and these, these uh, some very small portion of the business owners actually own and occupy their land. Most of the small businesses rent and they absorb the full cost of an increase to their taxes through triple net rent leases. So they are really taking the brunt of it, and I think we need to be fair about the taxes to keep um, to keep our small businesses alive. Thank you. We do, we do have to give the little community a chance to add to the MPA position, and then we'll switch. Yeah, I, I, I know. I, 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 Can I, 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 okay. Have I will let Bill speak to join with the MPA position, and then you can respond to that if that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, I won't uh, speak, uh, I could, but uh, I, I'd really like to challenge um, Councillor Louis. 6%. Where do you get 6%, 1% a year in three years? So, oh, Jane, because there's only one of me, can I talk speak twice? Yeah, you can speak twice. I, 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 I've got myself in this house like this. <laughs> well, I, you know, I mean, I, the arithmetic isn't there. We're going up 1% a year, and the term is three years. So, where, where's, this, where's the 6% with Councillor Louis? Is this another Vision Vancouver uh, fantasy uh, parade or what? Oh, thank you. And, and Council, uh, to be Councillor McCurry has now taken us to a debate format and perhaps we will have a final word from Councillor Well, it's, it is good, a good question uh, because Bill perhaps doesn't understand that when in a Vancouver system there's a share model, it's not a ratio model, and when you shift 1%, from one side of the equation, from uh, business over to residential, it becomes 2%. And that's what's been happening now for the past five years, that extra percentage, and in fact, in one year, the, the MPA froze business taxes completely. When the tax rate was 4%, it became 8%. And so that's what happens uh, when you shift 1% from one side over to the next. And perhaps Bill McCreary doesn't understand our tax system well enough, but that's how it works. And I'm sure the, the speaker understands what has been happening over the past couple of years in terms of residential taxes. And the last uh, word on this matter is going to NSP, to Elizabeth Burke. Thank you. Um, I, I think that what we have to look at is uh, twofold. One is that uh, Housing is extremely expensive in Vancouver and, and increasing the tax shift to the um, residential only makes that worse. But, but the small businesses are the, really suffering and we do have to work with them. So what I think we need to do is to look at the legislation around how, um, how tax is calculated and rather than uh, 
transferring from the residential to business, that we should be transferring from the larger businesses to the smaller businesses, so the mom pops can get a break. At the same time, we're not increasing the um, burden on residential. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a question uh, about uh, smart meters uh, in the context of the uh, precautionary principle, um, the Public Health Act of BC as it applies to municipal governments and their responsibilities to citizens, um, and in light of the fact that um, Health Canada now advises reducing our exposure to RMF, EMF from cell phones, um, especially children, and that more research is needed. And there's an overwhelming amount of people, doctors, medical people, uh, health, public health professionals around the world, particularly in Europe, who are warning us uh, about the dangers of these kinds of technologies becoming ubiquitous in society. Um, the Freiburger appeal, and I'll just pose my question in the context of a few facts here so that they can be answered. I'd like to maybe test the common sense team uh, tagline with uh, NPA and, and maybe the idea of vision with Vision Vancouver. Um, because Heather Beal told me last week that, uh, that you know there's no evidence. I need you know we need to come up with uh, more studies and so on and so on. Now, but there's tons of them. So the question is, in light of the fact that the Freiburger appeal of over 3,000 German medical doctors has stated that the heightened risk already present uh, with EMFs and microwaves stresses the body's immune system, can bring the body's functioning regulatory mechanisms to a halt. Pregnant women, children, and adolescents, elderly and sick people are especially at risk. Uh, you, can, you can learn about this at citizensforsafetechnology.org, of which I'm a member. But in light of all this fact and the precautionary principle, and in light of the fact that the BC Public Health Act, Bill 23, Section 83, 1 states, please listen to this, folks, a municipality must take action when it learns of something that could, could, could be harmful to its residents. I would like to know uh, if common sense will be applied, sir. Um, and I'd like to know, if, do you believe that the Smart Meter program should be stopped and an independent inquiry launched with full public hearings? If you don't believe that, please tell me why in the context of these facts. Thank you. I believe this program is over. This question, is, in essence, has already been asked by uh, Ken Chalko, so uh, Bill McClary will It take wasn't an answer. Yeah, he, uh, he talked about water meters, so I'd like a real answer, please. I'm Thank sorry, you. this is not a debate. This is a question. I'm, I'm moderating it. I'm giving the question to, uh, to Bill McClary. Okay, the, the question you're talking about is, is the um, um, cell phones and, and, and that kind of... Um, no, the smart meter. Okay, smart meter. Okay, okay well, that's, 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 as already been said, that's a BC Hydro jurisdiction. I would certainly, as a councillor, uh, when elected, I will uh, actively uh, engage BC Hydro and the provincial government to, uh, to make sure that this thing is reviewed. Uh, I have anecdotal evidence with regard to cell phones, for instance, from uh, uh, the son of a very good friend of mine who died from a brain tumor because he was a fisherman and he spent a lot of time like this in his fish boat with a cell phone. I've also had two, uh, two, two other people that I know of uh, that have had brain tumors from, uh, and this, the suspicion is it was cell phones. So that's anecdotal, I think, but it's certainly, uh, to me, it's something that I think we need to, do, we must take seriously and uh, the city must do what it can do to uh, make sure that this is looked into. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Louis, you also asked for a vision response. Yes, so we can't speak to what uh, Councillor Veal uh, might have said to you. But what I can say is that I personally went out to BC Hydro and did a bit of an investigation myself to understand the system that they're using and how much transmission actually occurs. The information that I received back was that they, uh, uh, as a, they create a, a network uh, at a local level, that no, local network, uh, it, they transmit once an hour and for one second, apparently, to a collection uh, uh, center. And then that collection center then uh, transmits once a day for one second to the, the central bank where, where they collect that information. So when you, 
when you think about the total amount of transmission in comparison to perhaps anyone here answering their cell phone, it's relatively small, or very, very small. Having said that, this is the information that I received. I, and I'm happy to go and talk with you further. Because I was, I was very much uh, concerned, as you are, you know, the precautionary principle is something that we should all take very seriously with, especially with our, with our uh, children and schools and such. So that's why I went out there and asked this information. Happy to talk with you further and get more information on how their information is flawed and go back and forth and advocate for the precautionary principle. And that's what I can promise that I will do uh, on an ongoing way because I, like you, want to make sure our city is safe for, for our citizens overall, especially our children. Thank you, Councillor Maria. Elizabeth Murphy would like to respond to. Thank you. And uh, yeah, regarding the smart meters, I think it's one of these issues that, that again, individuals should be able to choose if they don't want to have one of these meters on their home. At least they should have the right to refuse. And I, I don't believe that they are, are allowing that. So there certainly needs to be a, a much bigger discussion because it's not only an issue of, of health risks, which um, it could be significant, but it's also an issue of security too because it basically all of that data of exactly how much you use, when you use, when you're awake, when you, what you do is, is downloaded and transmitted and some people have raised concerns about that as well. And, and, and I think that really all of these issues should be looked at from a public perspective before BC Hydro just decides to do this to us. Thank you. Thank you. We have, uh, we have five more minutes for questions. We will ask some questions to stop with the gentleman in the back of the wheelchairs. And we'll take no more questions, but we'll run through the four people standing there. If that's acceptable for everybody. Because the public is really good. Um, I'll just do a one-liner then. I want to know what, if anything, does anyone plan to do about smoke-free housing? We're talking about Wi-Fi, we're talking about all these... I mean, this is an established health risk and it is virtually impossible. It is so incredibly difficult to find smoke-free access accessible housing. I have asthma. I've, had, I've been forced to move six times. I'm not a pedophile. I shouldn't have to move because I have a disability. Because people because I, can't, I simply do not have any rights. I, 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 theoretically, I'm protected in parks from secondhand smoke, but not in my own home. What, if anything, will anybody do about creating affordable housing for people with respiratory disabilities or people who wish to avoid developing them in the first place? Thank you. Who would like to jump into that? Okay, Cass going to jump. And then Cass go to me. First off, thank you so much and, uh, about bringing your personal situation forward here. I know it's probably difficult to This is part of the great process that we're going through. Uh, I thought about a number of things over the last six months, and this is the first time this has come up. So I'm going to tell you right from the heart, right from where I'm standing. I'm a non-smoker. Uh, for all you smokers out there, I'm supportive in all the quit smoking things that are, are out there. This is another one that I fully support. I see no reason why in uh, the, the city working with the province couldn't be able to provide that. Uh, I can tell you I'm a strata president as well, and I move strongly to make sure that you can't even smoke on your own patios, because I think that that's a, an inappropriate activity. So my answer to you is, is that yes, I will uh, be an advocate for you and your disability and others like you for that, because uh, you bring up a very good point. And again, thank you so much for bringing your person personal issues here for today. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you for the question. I'm also a director at the Metro Vancouver's Housing um, Committee as well, and we're dealing with that very same issue as we redevelop and, and look for opportunities to, to improve the, the situation in, in all of our buildings. That is something that I'm very interested in. In fact, I've been corresponding with uh, Dr. Stuart Kreisman, who's there. I don't know him yet. And, and, we've, and he's just sent me some more material that I've been reviewing to try to find a way, like in, in where was it, in Santa Monica, or Sonoma, uh, Sonoma in uh, County in California, in the uh, city of Santa Rosa, they introduced a bylaw that gave them that opportunity. That it's different here, I expect, because that was the United States and this is Canada, but we should be looking at it as much as possible. I know for, you know, just, I was just out for dinner with my family the other day at uh, a restaurant, and because we now have a blanket ban on smoking within restaurants, 
the experience of, for all of us, I think, is, is much improved. And when you do smell it, because the door was open and uh, smoke came in, we all noticed. And so I, I very much uh, uh, empathize with what you're saying, and we'll be working hard, very, very hard to try to make that happen. Thank you. We have a comment. Just add a couple more. I think this is a critical issue. My partner's a severe asthmatic, and it is a really serious question. When we were building co-op co housing, when the federal government was building co-op housing, they were building in allergy-free suites. Now that they're not funding the co-ops, and some of the co-ops are going under, we're losing those suites. And sometimes people are, those suites are being lost to people who don't have allergies. So we need to be working with the federal level government as well as the provincial level government on this one. And thank you for bringing it to our attention. And a final comment from NSC. Actually, I, I, if you look at most uh, rental housing, like pri private rental housing, most of the time they advertise for non-smokers. So it, it's very common in, in, in private housing. So certainly in, you know, with, with uh, subsidized housing, why couldn't that be a standard rule? I don't understand why that would be. <coughs> Well, in, in subsidized housing, I understand most of that they do allow smoking, which I, I yeah, think Yeah, but that's what I'm saying, is that, you know, in most of the, most of um, private, um, when, I mean, many of them re require non-smokers, so yeah, if sticks. they can do that at the, at pu with pub private, they certainly can do it with public. They don't, what's the point? Yeah. No, six of the, but six, they should. I know, they should, no, but what I'm saying is, what are you guys going to do to make sure that that does happen? Because out of the six places that I've been forced to move out of because of smokers, five of them had no smoking in my lease, which is why I signed in. And, and I had still a lack. The smokers didn't. I had to move. Um, thank do you, you, do thank you, you for the question. We need to move on, I'm afraid, because we have we are out of time. So if we could ask the, the remaining question is to direct the question to one of them. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> because my question is short, and I, I was going to say that if the answers are short, we should be able to hear a response from one rep of each of the parties. But the you're the moderator. The answer is short. All right. It, it concerns rental housing, and we hear terms bandied about loosely, affordable, subsidized, uh, whatever. So I'll stick to only one. In a figure relative to income, what is your definition of affordable? Short answer. One number, please. I would go by the definition provided by the Downtown Neighborhood Council, which is one third of your income if you're on income assistance or if you're in pension. Real, that's what real affordability is. Thank you. Adrian? Yes, it's 30% by most all studies that, uh, and, and institutes involved with You're this. talking gross or net? Gross. Thank you. Councilor Lewis? Next. 30% gross. Thank you. Can I speak? The, the standard is 30%. Thank you. And the MBA. It's 30%. Thank you. 30%. Right. Do we have an agreement between all candidates? Wow. <laughs> no, I, I, like, I just like to say it's very different that if somebody wants to move in, they have the income of $2,000. If someone's on income assistance, they're only got, they've only got $375 in income assistance rent. It's very different. So a developer can build something. He says, I'm going to build 20% affordability. It is not affordable for a pensioner or someone on That's income right. assistance. That's right. Thank you. friends are another group that are really being caught in this. Thank you. Now we have another question at the mic, and then one, and we are going to... My, my question is really about capital priorities. Early in the meeting, a reference to doing more to improve rec centers and recreation facilities and keep taxes down at the same time. And I also am a supporter of urban greenways and bikeways, but I live across from the intersection of 22nd and Quinella at Bella Clava, and I watch what, to me and my neighbors, is an insane amount of money being spent to put a peninsula where there was once a little island, instead of just a bit of signage and landscaping. So perhaps $100,000, I don't think that's an excess estimate may be under the cost of the months of work that went in to change that one intersection, I would argue leave a few of them much more simple because they've worked for 80 or 100 years and put the money in the rec centers. I wonder, 
Therefore, my question really is, have you or will you, Vision, really look thoroughly, not just at the greenways, but what are the priorities at the level of capital investment in the specific detail that the engineering department is spending? Because it is bloody awful, in my view, and at least a few neighbors. I don't know what others feel. So the short answer is yes. We intend to go through every nook and cranny of the city camp, of the city operation. We, what we, the first motion I moved at the beginning of uh, this term was the Vancouver Services Review, and as part of that, we engaged all of our staff. We looked at uh, giving, getting uh, information from every department, uh, senior senior staff down to the workers, and we also solicited input from our citizens as well on where we might be able to find savings. We've been working through about 2,000 uh, suggestions and we've implemented a number of them already to save tens of millions of dollars as part of the Bank of Research Review. A simple example is where garbage collection in our parks was a separate collection system than uh, our city municipal residential collection at the same time. It's now consolidated into one. Uh, Seven IT departments down to one. Purchasing uh, points within our city were 30 some odd, and now it's been reduced, I think, down to seven. So these are ongoing issues that uh, we've been dealing with, and down to that micro scale, yes, that's the intention, but we're trying to tackle the big ones first, and so far we've saved uh, tens of millions of dollars for the taxpayers, and that's how we'd be able to keep taxes in 2011 at 1.88%, which was below the rate of inflation. Thank you. And our last question is to the gentleman who, I mean, you may have stepped over coming into the room because I, we apologize once again for not allowing, not having a sign showing who handicapped access was. And one question, please, because we're down to like two cookies a piece at the moment. I'm just going to add to the Wi Fi debate. I'm a systems analyst and biochemist. So I understand the biology. The biology of it. I mean, and um, the computer side of it. Uh, I'd like to address Wi-Fi overlap. Even if some signals are very weak and some of them are and barely significant on the biology side, but if you turn on your Wi-Fi, your phone, suddenly sometimes you see 50 or 100 signals on that list. So how do they add up? So the question is Wi-Fi overlap. And that we have a question of how do we test for it because it's invisible. How, what's the intensity of in any given place that we might be eating, drinking coffee or eating something? And then there's regulation. How do you regulate overlapping Wi-Fi signals that people don't know of each other? Back to schools. In schools, we can do point-to-point -point and avoid Wi-Fi. It's a reverse technology where you don't actually continuously send or, or listen. You just send out to a monitor that says, ah, you're here, and then you start doing point-to-point -point signals, which can be way less effect on the body. That might be worth evaluating. That's, I open it to you now. So there's Wi-Fi overlap and point-to-point uh, -point technology for schools. Would you consider investigating implementing Wi-Fi an investigation into Wi-Fi overlap and point-to-point -point technology? I'm glad I came here tonight. I'm getting a, an engineering degree, I think. <laughs> uh, certainly, I, I think the, what you've described makes more sense than uh, creating an overlap, uh, especially in our schools, to, that have multiple signals like that. So, I'm discussing the Wi-Fi overlap generally, no matter where you go. And in the schools, the Wi-Fi signals can be removed to a high degree and replaced with point-to-point -point signals, but not the same technology. I'll make the, the, the school suggestion to the school board trustees and uh, ensure that they, they get that message. For the wider public overlap, uh, I'm at a loss. I don't know what to to do with at this point in time, other than to do a little more research. And maybe there's ways that we can spot checking, ensure that uh, there's uh, less. Uh, uh, you know, those, there's a there's perhaps some ways that we can shield or limit the amount of. Uh, uh, of usage within certain areas. So thank you. We've run out of time and we've run over. I'd like to thank all the candidates for coming tonight. I'd like to thank all